There's a pretty one, Ulysses. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of a wonderful new, very new novel from America. It is called Take What You Need, and the author is Idra Novi. I experienced this novel on audiobook only. Didn't have the benefit of reading along while listening, which is what I my preferred way of consuming audiobooks, but I sank right into it. It was expertly narrated by the author who did one of the storylines, and the other audio narrator who was also just amazing, was Christina Delane. Because I love this novel so much, I can't wait to get my hands on a hardcover first edition for, to display proudly on my shelf and reread in years to come. There are two main characters. One is a stepmother, the other is a stepdaughter, and those terms, those genealogical terms don't quite fit. But the stepmother is Jean, and she's in her 60s, and she lives in the rinky-dink town and I had to write this down because I knew I'd screw it up otherwise. The town is in the southern Allegheny Mountains of western Pennsylvania, and I knew I'd get the southern and western all screwed up because I don't know the area. The town of her birth. And the stepdaughter was born there, but hasn't lived, got out of there as soon as she could. In fact, I think after her father and her stepmother divorced soon after that, when she was 10 years old, they left. And the stepdaughter, Leah, has a lot of, shall we say, negative associations with the people that still live there and never did leave the Appalachian region. And that's one of the tensions in the novel. Let me tell you about the stepmother, Jean. Jean is my favorite character. I mean, I, was, I like both characters, but Jean won my heart. And she's probably one of my favorite characters in anything I've read so far this year. As I said, she's in her 60s. I can't remember if she married again, but she doesn't have any kids. She adored Leah for the few years that she was married to Leah's dad until Leah was 10. She's the only mother figure in Leah's life, but I'll talk about Leah more in a minute. Then she worked for a while. She worked at the bank or the library or something, and then she retired. And now, in her 60s, she has come into her own by... Creating art, creating specifically metal sculptures. She's inspired by the sculptor Louise Bourgeois. And there's one other one, uh, Agnes Martin or something. I can't remember that other name. And that's the problem with just doing it on audio. I have nothing to refer back to. But in her first person storyline, she peppers her narrative with quotes about sculpting and creativity that just add... A that just make her story all the more vibrant. If you like reading novels about artists, oh my God, this you're, this is a, a novel for you. There's so many other dimensions to it, but one of the things that's the most delightful is Jean as this wacky artist. She creates what she calls her metal sculptures. She calls them manglements. And she is healing herself. And this is not hokey. I mean, this this is not a woo-woo novel, not in any way. So get that out of your mind. <laughs> but she is healing herself and she is dialoguing. She is, all the phrases don't seem nuanced enough to explain what this novel does. But she's coming to terms with her past. And in fact, the epigraph to the novel is a quote from Louise Bourgeois. And let me share that with you. Every day you have to abandon your past or accept it. And then, if you cannot accept it, you become a sculptor. Beautiful, precisely perfect epigraph for this novel. Jean, is, she gets most of the metal. It's scrap metal, the title, take what you need, you know, signs, help yourself to this junk if you want it, and that's how she gets most of it, or basically begs, borrows, or steals. And I do mean steals in certain in a certain sort of way, and makes these humongous sculptures. She's got all the equipment, the welding and the chainsaw or whatever it is. <laughs> That's too much for me, but uh, in her house, she meets the kid next door. And by kid, I mean he's 20, Elliot. And he is also an incredibly fascinating character that really stole my heart. She lets him in her house after striking up a conversation with him, and immediately I, the reader, was on the edge of my seat. I'm nervous for her because 
It's a very white, very poor town and lots of drug use and addiction and poverty. And she's letting this young man in her house. He is instantly fascinated by what she's doing. Elliot doesn't display any artistic tendencies himself, but what he does reveal to her in that first meeting is a tenderness and curiosity about life. He's a young man of very few words. Even though this is in a very early chapter, I want you to discover the details for yourself. The best way I can put it without giving you all the details is that she needs medical attention urgently. And he takes care of her, gets her to the hospital, and gets her home and starts to visit her every day to, while she recovers. And so their connection, and you're never really sure, and she is never really sure, or not for a long time, is Jean sure about Elliot. That tension is one of the deepest, most powerful parts of the story. And she's attracted to him, and she knows the age difference. She knows that this is not something that she should explore, but she can't help being honest to herself that she is sexually attracted to him. He showers at her house because they don't have water at their house, and you can read all the details about that. And just listening to the through the closed, locked door, I presume it's locked, <laughs> he, she can hear the water um, cascading down his his uh, his naked body, and she gets turned on. And she's so confused by it, and she's so upset at herself for it. Reading about that and where that part of the story goes just made me cringe, and I loved the way it made me cringe. And I wish that experience for you, because it's just a really bold portrayal of sexuality, sensuality, and how it can bring people together and, and pull people apart. And, and it's just handled so beautifully and so cringeworthily, if I can put it that way, one of my favorite aspects and the, one of the most uncomfortable parts of it. Elliot is an uncomfortable character to reckon with for the reader. And so then that's a good place to switch over to the Leah portion. So Leah's the stepdaughter. And the reason I said at the beginning that stepmom and stepdaughter are kind of not quite the right words is because Jean, the stepmom, left Leah's father when Leah was only 10. But because Leah's mom died when she was a baby or a toddler or something, Jean is the only mother figure she ever had. She, she was so, such a nurturing, loving presence in her life, and then she disappeared. They've had a really difficult, on-again, really episodic relationship ever since. Leah is married to a Peruvian guy and has a toddler son, and they are on their way down to Pennsylvania after Elliot phones Leah to say that her stepmom, Jean, has died, and that Jean has left Leah her sculptures. And so there's a time jump. There's a time difference in the in the narratives. And as I said before, Leah is really got a lot of, uh, you can call them hang-ups, you can call them justifiable prejudices, or however you um, want to describe it, but she is really nervous to go back down to her Appalachian hometown. The story is set at the beginning of this Trump era that we're all suffering through. The Republican primaries before the 2016 election are happening, so that's 2015. And that horrific political ambiance permeates absolutely everything else that's happening. This is a novel that's about trust and mistrust between people of different backgrounds, different classes, and superficial judgments based on income, appearance, personal hygiene, and ra racial issues, Trumpian, all that Trumpian crap. It's explored so sensitively without any editorial stuff at all. More than any work of fiction that I've read that has come out since the Trump era began. Through these stories that resonate in such uncomfortable often cringeworthy ways. And I have to say that there was a p certain points in the second half of the novel where I, my, I started to interpret my cringing as, oh, maybe this novel is kind of going off the rails. Am I losing the plot? Is the plot losing me? 
I'm somebody who bails at the drop of a hat, but I kept going, and by the end I realized the cringing was the point. And in that cringing, in the way that the, her characters squirm, through some sorcery of her own devising, Idra Novi has woven the creativity and the messiness and the cringing together that is required for us to get onto the other side of all this. And this novel pulsates with all of that. It's just incredible. Please try it. Thanks for watching. Thank you.